Hello, hello. Today we will uh, discuss a very practical issue, the passive leg raising, how to do it. And of course, we are going to Professor Xavier Monet, who is really a world expert on this. He has been largely involved in the development of the test. He is professor of intensive care medicine and intensivist at the Bicetre Hospital in Paris. So, Xavier, it's some kind of an internal fluid challenge. Yes, Jean-Louis, and thank you first for the invitation. Yes, this uh, passive leg raising test that we have developed now um, uh, 15 years ago is a test that mimics a fluid challenge because it induces the transfer very simply of some venous blood from the legs, but also from the large splanchnic compartment to the cardiac cavity. So it's like a preload challenge, but of course the advantage is that it's reversible. All right, so let's focus first on the patients. In which patients will it give reliable information? And more importantly, in which patients it will not give reliable information? In fact, the, this test, we have developed it as an alternative to pulse pressure variation, which is very reliable, but which you know has many limitations. In many instances, you cannot use PPV or stroke volume variations. And the passive leg raising has the advantage that it remains reliable in these patients, like spontaneously breathing patients first, but also patients with cardiac arrhythmias and low tidal volume with AODNs. Nevertheless, there is likely one situation where the PLR test is less reliable is intra-abdominal hypertension with yeah. some false negatives yeah. in high levels. Yeah, very good. Uh, so yeah. it's independent on the um, ventilatory conditions in patients who are mechanically ventilated, the tidal volume, the PEEP level would not influence the response very much? Yes, actually, the, the test is uh, totally independent from ventilation. You can easily understand that. And so it means that in patients with spontaneous breathing, uh, so even in non-intubated patients, in patients with low tidal volume, with high PEEP levels, it remains reliable, which is, of course, not the case for the heartland interactions derived. Uh, okay, very good. Really let's, let's speak about the, the way to do it. Uh, people say, I just raised the legs. Is it correct? Uh, unfortunately, not, not exactly. The, um, there are some, some very simple rules, but that must be respected. Uh, perhaps the first one, and likely the most important, is that you must start the test from the semi-recumbent position, I mean at 30 degrees at least. Because in this way, when you move the patient, you use the... Uh, the venous compartment of the splanchnic territory, which is very large, as you know. So it improves the sensitivity of the test. Second, very important, you should not take the heels of the patient and, and, and left it yourself. Rather use the automated bed motion because it may otherwise induce some pain and interfere with the test and etc. And third will, once the patient is back to the baseline position, check that cardiac output has went back also to its initial value, that the test is actually fully reversible before uh, giving fluid. Okay, now, um, if I have no hemodynamic monitoring available, I just look at the blood pressure, correct? Maybe the heart rate? It's not very good. And especially you have many false negatives. You know, uh, the um, passive leg raising is just like a fluid challenge. And it's the same when you give fluid the assessment with blood pressure only provides a rough estimation of the response of cardiac output. So a very reliable assessment of the PLR test needs a direct assessment of cardiac output, whatever the way you, you measure it, but you need something that measures cardiac output. With blood pressure, again, it's not that good, unfortunately, because it's a big limitation of the test. Now, in, in, in trauma at the roadside, um, 
it's a current recommendation to raise the legs precisely to bring more blood to the to the heart. The blood pressure may increase in these conditions, right? Right, but it's a, it's a resultant of the increase in cardiac output. Basically, when you increase preload, what must increase is cardiac output in case of preload responsiveness. The increase in, in arterial pressure is just a consequence, but as you know, we will not speak here about basic physiology, but it's blood pressure and cardiac output are disconnected because of the uh, uh, sympathetic stimulation. So a very precise measurement of the test needs an assessment of cardiac output. You can do that with cardiac output monitoring device, but also with other surrogates of cardiac output or, or stroke volume. Uh, yeah, like what? Um, you can use... Um, uh, the, the big monitoring devices and costly and invasive devices that measure cardiac output, like pulse control analysis, um, echocardiography is likely reliable, but also there are some uh, other clever ways to uh, assess the changes in cardiac output. For instance, in patients with very stable ventilation, you can use the changes in the entitled CO2, which reflects the changes in cardiac output. The anesthesiologists know that very well. Recently, we have shown that, we showed that the changes in the SpO2 amplitude, the petsmographic signal, are also connected to the amplitude of cardiac output, if I may say, and it changes with passive leg raising. It should be confirmed, but it might be an easy, of course, a very widely used way to assess the effects of the, of the test without, again, a big, costly, invasive monitoring device. But if the changes in cardiac output are quite transient, isn't it better to evaluate stroke volume rather than cardiac output? The difference, uh, of course, relies in, uh, remains um, in, in um, heart rate, which does not change that much with passive leg raising. So in theory, you're right. You should rather assess stroke volume. In practice, the changes in cardiac output are not very different because heart rate doesn't change that much. No, the test. yeah, what I alluded to is that the cardiac output measurement may average too many beats so that you may lose a little bit of the signal you generate with the passive leg raising. That's right, and it's a very important point that, that many people uh, I don't, uh, don't really have in mind. The effects of the test are, tra are rapid, but sometimes, sometimes transient. In some patients, after one minute, the changes in cardiac output are less or cardiac output decreases. So you must have something that catches the uh, uh, changes in cardiac output immediately, if I may say. So real-time monitoring of cardiac output. With, um, for instance, some uh, pulse control analysis devices, the average time is not that long, and so it's okay, you can assess the effects of the yeah. test. But for instance, with thermodilution, the PA catheter, the thermodilution with the PICO are not appropriate because really you need some time to inject and, and check the measurement and etc. So it's not really the right devices for that. Can I use an echo system, echo Doppler studies, even if I am not an expert? Uh, yes, ECHO definitely is used by many colleagues, and, and it is really a beat-to-beat -beat measurement of, uh, of cardiac output and stroke volume. Um, one point is that you don't need to measure cardiac output. I mean, you don't need to measure the, you know, the, the diameter of the uh, subaortic um, uh, area. Um, because, in fact, you just have to assess the changes in the velocity time integral, the which VDI. are mm -hmm. The VTI proportional to the changes in stroke volume, so it's much easier. Also, you must check that your beam, the echo beam, remains in the outflow of the left ventricle when you move the patient. That's why I like to do that with another, another person that moves the bed while I keep my hand on the patient, being sure that the echo beam remains within the flow, and in this way, I trust really the echo measurement. Yeah, I suppose it's very important for the patient not to be stressed by the, by the test. 
Um, would you explain the test to a conscious patient or do you have other tricks to avoid uh, an increase in blood pressure and heart rate simply due to the stress associated with the change in position? It's right that in patients who are really conscious, they might be, of course, uh, uh, surprised by, by the test. And so you must uh, cautiously warn the patient about what's going to happen. Also, in, the, in some patients, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, I think it's good to suction the patient before the test because otherwise the, the cough will, of course, uh, interfere with the results. So in very conscious patients, yes, please warn the patient before you do that. Then, of course, it's very easy and painless. So if I see a positive response, then uh, I get fluids, 500, let's go. What should I do? Be careful, be careful, because you must keep in mind that the fact that the patient is preload responsive doesn't mean automatically that he or she should receive fluid because uh, just preload responsiveness is a normal condition. First, you must check that it is useful to increase cardiac output first and then you may think about fluid to increase cardiac output and assess fluid responsiveness. First check if lactate has increased, SVO2 has decreased, urine output has decreased, RCT has uh, increased etc. Then you may think yes I should perhaps increase cardiac output and fluids might be useful for that. So Preload responsive patients should not be automatically uh, filled with fluid. This is something very important in practice. Although you may say that if you do the test, it's because you, you are already raising the question, could this patient benefit from fluid? Okay, exactly. well, I think this was very, very useful, Xavier. Thank you very much for these very clear explanations. Uh, I think we will all appreciate that. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.